Hi, my name is Shlomo Shapiro, and I'm working at Immobilien Scout 24, which is Germany's leading real estate listing portal. So if you live in Germany, you probably already found a new home through our website. If not, come and check it out. We have lots to offer. But here I'm more to talk about DevOps and especially what happens if you already do DevOps for quite some time like we do and how to deal with the risks that probably are now different than in the times before you were doing DevOps. Let's start from a question. Who is doing DevOps here? Okay, very interesting, not everybody. So I hope that this talk will help those who don't do DevOps to maybe get yet another argument for their bosses why it would be interesting to check out how to do things the DevOps way. Well, this is probably common wisdom. If you take software from planning through development, testing, and into production, then of course errors happen and need to be fixed. And the cost of fixing these errors, of course, changes. Fixing an error here is much cheaper than actually fixing it there. That's why it pays off to try to fix all errors early on in design. And those of you who run old software, old meaning older than 12 months, probably already thought about a redesign or were upset about the initial design and an older company like ours, Immobilien Scout is now more than 15 years old, is running code that is partially also 15 years old. So a lot of the design decisions which we made early on are not valid anymore. So we suffer from that. One of the learnings we have is that we try to fix errors as early and not as late as possible. And DevOps doesn't make this easier because if you look at the development cycle of software in software development, that's how it looks at least in our company. You have a rather long time of planning and designing and user experience and wireframes and what else. After that, you have a shorter development time. And after that, you have test and an even shorter production time. This works quite well. and. I think that this helps the developers actually to reduce design errors. In operations, we also do software development and everybody who's doing operations is actually doing software development, even if you don't call it that. The difference is that usually we have an idea over coffee and then we start hacking, right? And then we put it in production and call it testing. <laughs> <laughs> and then we run it, and then we're often afraid to touch it because we know that if you touch it, it's probably going to break. And I have a long history in operations, so I know what I'm talking about. If you look at these two things in comparison, the first thing I would notice is that actually operations seem to be more risky than development. Because in operations, we spend less time on planning and designing, and we spend less time on the cheap fixing area, so to say. And in production, we much, much faster go into production, and then fixing errors, especially fixing design errors, is really costly. Why does that matter? Well, as a company, you obviously don't earn money on broken stuff. So if you look at typical outages, at least typical in our kind of business, which is running a website, you can ask yourself, okay, who's guilty for those outages? Who did the initial error? Who should have done something different? And we all know that the blame game doesn't help, but in the end, it helps to understand what to do different the next time you go there. And if you look at these, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm sure everybody can find themselves somewhere here. <laughs> Me too, included. I did almost all of them already. So I'm not ashamed to show them. So what about DevOps? 
DevOps in the nutshell is respect and learning, in my opinion. And it goes both ways. Both sides, developers and admins, have to respect each other and have to learn from each other. And the devs, the developers, can learn from ops a lot about operability, how to optimize software so that it's not only nice to develop, but also nice to run it. And if you look at software development cycles, in some cases, you develop it for, let's say, half a year, and then you run it for 10 years. So why not optimize a little bit better for how to run it for 10 years and not only for how to program it? The admins, of course, also can learn a lot from the developers. For example, incremental improvement. Start small, do a minimum viable product and see how it develops. Improve it further on. Or coding instead of hacking. And let's not go into that. Test-driven is a big thing from development, which is already really established in development and in operations, we're slowly learning how to do test-driven. And actually, this talk is also about how to do test-driven in infrastructure development. A very nice thing is code quality. Who is a developer and cares about code quality? Hands up. Okay. Who is an admin and cares about code quality? Okay, why the difference? Why is code quality in operations different from code quality in development? It's all about craftsmanship, about writing code to be read later, write for reading, not write for it works. Don't do comments, do readable code. All this stuff is code quality. So that's stuff which really works well in development and it works even better in operations. Actually, I believe that the reason is that the stuff which we develop in operations is more complex which the, than the stuff being developed in development. Because we instrument systems and landscapes of systems and very complex things that need to play together and that are often very difficult to test in a sandbox. That's why I think that the challenge of development in infrastructure is actually at le as least as high as the challenge of development in pure software development. And my favorite, of course, test automation. And yes, test automation is the only way how to solve this problem. Because this is a big truth. Untested means broken. And another big truth is no tests means legacy. Because if there are no tests, you don't know how to touch this code. You have to be afraid of touching this code. And the only way how to fight this fear is by having tests and test automation. And in our world, this is true. Untested means broken. And there's a very nice example for which I can tell you. We recently did a complete rewrite of our system authentication layer, like how the Linux systems authenticate users when they log in. And of course, we did that test-driven. And of course, we forgot one use case. And when the original servers LDAP were switched off, and only the new servers, Active Directory, stayed available, of course, nothing worked anymore. Because we forgot about this little use case, which was necessary there. And we looked into the code and said, well, where's the test? There's no test, so obviously it won't work, right? It's simple. It's something a developer would always do. But in operations, we also do that. No test, no work. So then we wrote a test, we fixed the code, and it worked again. The problem was, of course, that our PAM patching code didn't expect that the PAM LDAP module was missing, which, from a, which just happens if you set up a server without PAM LDAP, and then our hook for patching the file was missing. So no patching happened, so no login was possible. Actually simple, but again, no test, no work. So what is this thing about tests? There are a lot of books about tests and what you can do with tests and how to write tests. And I think for us guys in operations, the simple version is enough. The simple version is that there are two types of tests. Number one is unit tests. And a unit test 
test the smallest possible component in an artificial environment. So try to think how to cut down everything that is not needed to test a single feature, a single aspect, a single function. In development, this is much more complex and you do unit testing on all kinds of levels. But in operations, that is okay. Try to think how to cut it down, how to strip it down. And if stripping down means setting up a server and running something, that can be a unit test. In development, you say a unit test doesn't have any external dependencies and so on, but in operations, you have to see what fits the problem. The other test you need is the opposite. It's the system test. The system test has the job of testing the entire application in a realistic environment and also testing it with other applications together because you need to test the cooperation, the interoperation between different applications before you roll a change into production. That's all you need to get into test-driven development in infrastructure. So, a little overview. Typical things for unit tests are they're built part of the build process early on. And they have quick feedback cycles. A unit test should give you an answer with mere seconds. So you can run it after every save of a file, after, after every code change, a single line changed, you run the test, it tells you yes or no. That's a unit test. Also, very important, syntax checks. Sounds stupid, sounds silly, but hey, how many failures did you have due to a missing semicolon or other stuff? Happens to everyone, so easy to fix, write a test. And the other side, system tests usually start from installing something on a test server because you want to test your code in a realistic environment. So you have to install it on a realistic test server that behaves like the real thing. And very important, you run tests from outside because usually you use servers from outside, you use their services, so also in the test case, you have to do the same. And you, of course, also can run tests from inside, which is especially useful to simulate error conditions. Like, you remove the network, what happens? Of course, you remove the network from inside, and RSH is a very useful tool for that, because in that scenario, you don't need the super-duper security, you need the super-duper automation. And SSH and automation suck. And don't forget, a reboot is also a test. The last thing I did in my consulting years was reboot before leaving the customer. Because I didn't want to go back to the customer the next morning after they rebooted the server. So, yes, rebooting is a test. It doesn't cost much. You do it from inside, sudo reboot, you wait a moment, you run the standard test from outside, and you know if it's good. And if it doesn't work, then you know you have to fix it. And that actually will save you once getting up at night or save you buying your admin colleagues a crate of beer. A few examples from the real world. Those who know us, they already heard that we use RPMs for everything. Software configuration, doesn't matter what, everything that goes on our servers has to be packaged in an RPM package. And RPM packages have spec files as their master plan. This is a typical spec file. It has like some preparation, installation, installing into some fake chain shoot environment and some files that are then shipped as part of the package. And the most simple thing you can do as a unit test is a syntax check as part of the build phase of your package or whatever other tool you use to ship stuff to servers. And if you use sudo and you ship sudoers, please syntax check them like that. Because if you don't, you'll cut off the tree you're sitting on. Because if you have a syntax error in the sudoers file, sudo will refuse cooperation. Even if the rule you would be using is in a different file. The complete sudo stops to work. Another typical example you can find in hundreds of packages in our source repository is this. Syntax check, bash, syntax check, Python, syntax check, YAML. Very important. 
If you have configuration, test it before deployment. Because configuration is also code. And configuration can break your server just the same like code can break your server. So the more you test configuration, at least for obvious errors like, like syntax errors, the more robust your world will be and the more resilient your deployments will be. Because that means if it doesn't work, it won't build. And if it won't build, it can't harm my system. There are lots of more examples. If you look on my homepage, you'll see another talk about this topic, which has a few more. The more interesting part, of course, are system tests. Like in this example, a system test tests the entire system in a realistic environment. Same when you have a car checked every two years. They don't take off the wheels to check them. They check the wheels on the car as it runs on the street. And they put a fake street under it so that it's easier to handle the then stationary car. And that's the important thing about system tests. The important thing is how to mock away the things that are irrelevant for the test. And this is a perfect example for mocking. Right? The car feels like driving on the street. It behaves like driving on the street. But it's actually stationary in the garage where the test is being run on these wheels. So everything is real, and everything that's irrelevant for the test is mocked away with these little two wheels here. And that allows this test to run anywhere, anytime, under stable conditions. And actually, we have trailers with this setup driving around the countryside so that people can check their brakes. And the same about unit tests, uh, about system tests in IT. You want the system test to be exactly so that your code runs as expected without depending too much on external environments which you cannot provide together with the test. A little bit about build automation. Of course, nobody runs these tests manually because then you would be busy testing instead of coding. So in our world, the build automation looks like that. We have a source repository, like everybody else. We have a central build automation tool, in our case, Team City. Many people use Jenkins, but there are others. Even a sophisticated bash script could be enough for that purpose. If a change happens, it gets checked out on a build server, which runs unit tests, creates an RPM package, and uploads it into a dev yum repository. So far, so easy. The next step is deploying that package onto a test server and running system tests. Now, this takes maybe 20 seconds. This can take several minutes. But if the unit tests fail, I don't need to run the system tests because it's irrelevant. That's the thing about quick feedback, slower feedback. Small test, big test. If the test was successful, the same RPM package is moved to a production YAM repository. And from there, it's deployed by the same build automation to our production servers. And that way, we basically instrument our entire platform. And any change goes this way from source code to production. And that's actually how DevOps works. Because DevOps, in our case, means devs and ops can co provide commits into these source repositories. And it doesn't matter if the source code is turned into our whatever billing application or into our OS provisioning. Everybody can pro contribute to both of them. If they dare, if they know, if they ask their colleagues for a code review and so on, but they can. And that's the big change in DevOps. They can. If they want to, just go, do it. And we have test automation. So if you break it, it won't build. Don't be afraid. Just try it out. And that's the important thing to learn here. It's not enough to allow people to change code. You have to help people to overcome their fears, to overcome their kind of natural resistance to work in fields where they're not really proficient. Because many improvements are a small improvement. Oh, I don't like that provisioning takes five minutes, but 
look, I see there is a simple solution to fix it. Okay, one minute saved. But maybe nobody in production had time for that. Maybe the developer who was testing the provisioning, including the setup of a software, if it runs in this initial kind of border case condition, he was sitting there and waiting for machines to boot and install and boot and install and got annoyed. So he fixed it. A few more examples from the system testing world, and yes, they are ops related. Um, who uses persistent storage? Okay, everybody else? What do you do? I mean, you have to store stuff somewhere. <laughs> so in our world, each virtual machine has one or two hard disks. One hard disk is the system disk, and we always wipe it and format it and install it from fresh. And if you store stuff on the system disk, you know that it will be gone eventually. If you need persistent storage in a virtual machine, you have to add a persistent storage disk. For those who use AWS, EBS is the keyword here. But the idea is the same. You have a system and you have a persistent storage. Now, how does the persistent storage get configured into the system? Where to mount it, where to format it, and so on. In our case, we wrote a service for that, the XAN mount service, which uses certain algorithms to determine what to do, like, oh, I have one extra disk, oh, it has a file system label, persist something, let's mount that. Actually, not difficult, about 200 lines of bash. But if that service fails, then in all our platform, the persistent storage will be gone. So how do we protect ourselves against this risk? We write a test. In this case, we write a test that runs through all possible permutations of actions that this service could do, including error scenarios. And we use mocking so that we don't have to connect real storage, but we use a low setup to provide an image file as a persistent disk. And this is very convenient because I can also simulate different scenarios. I can add two or three disks and see what happens and so on. And I test, of course, service start stop that the service mounts and unmounts my persistent storage as required. And now I have a delivery chain with the source code, sign mount service. And as part of that, a virtual machine gets provisioned and set up with a little bit of fake storage and all the tests run. And now I can tell everybody, you don't like the persistent storage handling? Fix it. And they can fix it, and I can be sure that if the tests run, it will work in production. The important thing is always what to mock away and what not. And Linux provides you such a huge basket with little tools and tricks how to mock stuff. You can use routing or firewalling to fake network problems. It might, actually, you should be doing both, because if you set a route to dev null, it behaves different than if you drop packages. And you might test your software against those two scenarios. Another example. Who's using a proxy for their servers to access the internet? Okay. Who is allowing direct connection from web servers to the internet? Okay, impressive. Because we don't trust our web servers. Web servers can be hacked, and hacked web servers can download additional stuff. So we use a web proxy, Squid in this case, as an application layer firewall for outgoing HTTP traffic. Again. If a configuration change in the proxy service would go wrong, then all our platform would not be able to talk with the internet. And then a lot of additional value services on our platform would stop to work. So we wanted to cover the entire proxy configuration with tests. Not the proxy code. The proxy code is quit and it's from upstream and we never touch it. But for us, the configuration of the proxy service is also code that can break the platform. And we wanted to cover that with tests. And the way how we do that is we run each configuration change through a big set of system tests. 
for that, we set up a test squid server, load the configuration there, and then for each function group, which is in our world kind of a role, we do at least one test to make sure that the most important HTTP call for that function group goes through this configuration set. And we use, for example, x forwarded four headers to spoof the source address so that on our build server, we can set, let's, this request comes from function group five. And the rule set will think it's function group five. And then we check for access denied messages because, of course, the test server doesn't have internet access. You don't want your test calls to go against the production servers of your partners. That might make them upset and that might cost you money if it's a billable service. So obviously the test server doesn't have any internet access, which leads to a very funny result. If I have a request, and this is the server that should be allowed to do the request to an external URL, in the good case, I get a bad gateway error because the squid on the test server allowed the request, but it can't go to the internet. If the rule is wrong, or if I have an error there, then I get a forbidden from the rule set in the squid and error access denied. And this, in the test case, would mean test failed. So this is completely upside down, like bad gateway is good, forbidden is bad, but the test was successful. And this is again about mocking. You need to know what you mock, and then when you know what to mock, you know how to write the test that reacts to the right triggers from your mocking environment. Last example, VM provisioning. We also have servers in our data center, which we need to provision. And every morning we have a test set up running for 15 minutes and setting up various virtual machines some of them broken, some of them good, and we check that the broken ones are not allowed to work and the good ones are allowed to work and that on the good ones actually the automatic and automated environment will set up a working Linux operating system. All that happens every night so that we know, okay, we can still provision new systems. And that's a very huge system test, but it's also very valuable because they're about I don't know, 20 software packages that go into this automated provisioning setup, which we have for virtual machines and for hardware. This is actually open source and you can go there and find all the code for the system test and so on. If you do that for all your platform, you get different release cycles for different software packages and each release software package goes its own way from development to production. And in the end, they all meet somewhere in production. And you know that they work together because of your tests. We call it continuous life deployment. That's our way how to maintain, stably maintain a always changing platform. And the general rule is we deploy applications when they're ready and we automate the, del the delivery chains from source to production. The end result is low risk, lots of fun. And that's the whole thing about DevOps risk mitigation. You have all the fun from DevOps, from doing stuff together, but you have a low risk and you're not afraid to do stuff together. You'll find the slides here, plus a few more links and other talks about this topic. I'm at the end of my talk. Needless to say, we're hiring. So if you have a passion for automation, and for keeping things simple, please talk to the people who have our logo on the back. Thank you very much, and we have 15 minutes for questions. So, uh, any questions from anyone? So first, thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, in one of your examples, actually the last one, testing the proxy, you kind of showed how you would use error conditions because you don't want to rely on external services. And I wonder if you could compare this to, to actually mocking it by like recording and replaying responses or stuff like this. Why did you not choose it or what are your opinions on this? 
Okay, um, it's a good question. And I think that's exactly a question about dev or ops. So as a dev person, I would think, how can I mock away the internet? As an ops person, I say, I don't need to mock the internet. I just need to deal with it. And this code has been written by an ops development team. And so the solution is, let's take a server, let's let it do what it usually does, because setting up a server with a proxy and the configuration, it's just standard. You say new server type proxy, go, 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 done. So there's nothing needed to do for that. The only thing that we had to do for the mocking actually was to set up the test server in our dev environment, which in general doesn't have internet access. So in this case, I would say the answer is it was the easiest thing to do. Like the cheapest in terms of effort and in terms of changing the system. The only other change which we did to the proxy configuration was to allow the build servers that run the tests to use the X forwarded for header to simulate the actual originating IP. That's the only real change to the configuration which we did. We use load balancers internally, so normally only the load balancers are allowed to use X forwarded for and nobody else. And for the system test to work, of course, the build agent that runs the script that runs through all that needs also to be allowed to use X forwarded for. But that's all. Except everything else is the original production configuration. And maybe I didn't say that. In this case, the entire proxy configuration re resides in a software RPM package. So we have a source repository, and there we have all the proxy configuration and the test cases. And each time somebody needs to change the proxy configuration, we just do a new release of the proxy configuration RPM. And that RPM goes first on the test server. It runs through all the tests. And then the same RPM is installed on the production proxy servers. And then we know for sure that that set of configuration works. And the end result is that now developers add proxy configuration to their function groups. If you're a developer and you set up a new software, then you go into this software package that contains the proxy configuration and add your own proxy configuration for the calls you need to make. Plus one few test cases and you're done. You just wait 10 minutes and then it's live in production. And that's how we play DevOps and that's how we bring Dev and Ops together in improving our platform and reducing turnover cycles, development cycles, and so on. So you had this chart about automation, and automation, automation is great because we are all lazy, right? So, but there you, and you even just repeated that, that if I commit something, that automatically goes live. Right. So, but you also had the slide with the release cycles, so what's your your politics there, everything goes live as soon as I commit it and it passes the tests, or yes. is there anything else? Well, depends on the team and on the software product. More and more teams put more trust in their tests than in the ability of the product manager to push the release button. But the ideal situation is you trust your tests, because the tests are documented knowledge about your platform. And the manager putting, pushing the release button is just believe. I believe this will be good. Push. Yes. Uh, so in the setup that you've described here, how would you typically deal with replicating, say, your production database onto the test server? Would you fully replicate it or try to do something partial? Because one of the things that we find uh, most dangerous when we're deploying is things like schema changes that are very difficult to test against fully. Well, in our world, everything has to be a package and everything that acts has to be a service. Like any acting part in our platform has to be a service that can be started, stopped, and that has a status. So database changes also have to be a service. And 
we have services that do database changes as needed when they detect a new database schema. And that also happens, for example, here. Because together with that package comes a new database schema. The services here say, oh, new database schema, let's update the database. And the task of reducing data from production to test belongs to the developer who is creating the data or whose software is creating the data. And for each software, one of the tasks on the checklist for production ready is, did you write something that will create a test database from production? And then the reduction of the data, anonymization, removal of personal information, of people information, it's all their problem because they created the database. And that's the only way how you can scale to hundreds of roles or function groups. Otherwise, you have a team which just runs behind the others and always needs to adapt their changes into the conversion process. I wouldn't want to work in that team. So you described how you cover your ops code with tests. Do you also do it in a test-driven way, like in a narrow sense, writing tests first, doing baby steps, Refactoring, yes. does yes. it make sense in this yes. scenario? Yes, we do that. We have a lot of Python code in operations. What I mentioned initially, the example I mentioned about the authentication code, it's managed by a Python script that does all the patching on the Linux configuration file level, and that has full test coverage with Python unit tests. And yes, we write, in this case, we first wrote the test and then the code that does the patches. And that's why, in the end, the feature for which we didn't write a test also didn't have the code. Yes, test first. It doesn't mean that it's easy test first, by the way, especially in operations where sometimes testing means setting up a lot of stuff. But yes, we do that. Um, you describe a, 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 a build automation workflow that actually tests lots of RPMs. Well, what about when you are testing things like uh, configuration management, Puppet, Chef, uh, all that kind of systems? How do, do you have those kind of changes also included in your workflow? Well, as I said, all configuration is in packages. We don't have Puppet. We you, don't, you don't use that? We don't need Puppet because Puppet solves problems which we don't have. <laughs> okay. Fine, fair enough. So, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's good but, to know. But I, if you would go to a Puppet conference, you would find out that making Puppet recipes testable is a really big problem. And the reason it's a big problem is that Puppet combines code and configuration in a very nasty way. Well, uh, I mean, okay, it's fine. <laughs> Leaving Puppet outside, uh, if you would try to do testing some kinds of uh, things like... Um, uh, duplications or um, uh, stuff like that, you need to set up a like, really, really complex uh, a networking setup, and that's go way beyond just getting a uh, VM. Uh, it's, less, it's like getting two or three VMs that you have to get networking with, with between them and try to check stuff like that. It's not so easy, like just running a. a Actually, test it is. There. Uh, here I mentioned one package, but our automation can easily ha handle an arbitrary number of packages which are involved in this change. Because the system tests running here uh, trigger the propagation of the packages. And we, of course, have a hook that actually propagates the packages that were installed on the test server. So in the, test, in the job here, I say five packages are relevant for this feature. And then it will propagate all these five RPMs if they're here and installed on the test server to the production repository. Which is fine for deployment. What happens when you have to just like my SQL that is not responding and your slave is way beyond whatever it should be? How do you test that your, the rest of your system is coping with that? Well, we. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm just looking for. What's the framework you use to automate that kind of tasks? We use the framework called Keep It Simple. Uh, <laughs> Keep It Simple means that the average developer doesn't take too long to write his first piece of useful code. 
In many cases, that means we have some part on the build server, which runs the job, that will RSH into the test server and do some nasty manipulation before running a test. And we use RSH because in RSH you can just say, well, this IP range is allowed, and you don't need to bother about faking away SSH keys. So basically you have to write the logic into the spec files, the logic which is mostly included in Puppet. Uh, no. The spec files provide a simplified way of doing the same thing. We separate configuration files depending on how they change. And that's why we get away with a lot less patching than you usually do in a Puppet world. Puppet is good at patching stuff, but we lay out configuration so that it doesn't need to be patched. That's why I said Puppet solves a problem which we don't have. All right. I just wanted to add that the Puppet situation about testing and testable code is much better than it used to be. There is Beaker, and there are some other tools to, to deal with that. I know. The community has been active because there was a big problem. Uh, but, but the end, I think what I'm saying is that you need unit tests and system tests, regardless of the tooling you use. And even if you use Puppet, Chef, whatever tooling, you still need unit tests and system tests. And the unit test will still test something small, and the system test will test something big. The question is always, how do you express it, how do you abstract it, and so on. And how do you make sure that the stuff you tested goes unchanged into production? In our case, it's simple because the RPM is created once. And we never create RPMs again after a successful test. That's evil. You deploy in production that what you tested and not something else. And if you have a world where you test something and then you create something else to deploy in production, you always have this little gap that can go wrong. And you'll for sure find a smart hacker who will be happy to use that gap for his own purposes. Uh, okay, I, I also have to ask for a detail because it just sounds too great what you are saying. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we were discussing the migrations and the continuous deployment. Um, do you manage to do migrations without service interruptions? Because when we do migration, we have to at least partially shut down services, and we, we can't do that just because somebody said push to the repository. Well, there are several layers on which this question needs to be answered. The first layer is, can your application handle the situation where the old and the new version runs alongside? Because if the application can't handle that, then the deployment won't help. So first, make your application so that version 5 and version 6 can work together on the same database. Make it so that the database upgrade from version 5 to 6 will not harm the version 5 code using that same database. That's the first step on the application level. Then you can go to the operations level and say, OK, I have 20 web servers, and I want to have a rolling upgrade going through these web servers so that there is no external impact. And yes, we're doing that. In our world, it's very simple. Any server is allowed to install the, YUM the RPM packages presented to it through the various YUM repositories attached. And we have a tooling called YATShell, which does the rolling upgrade, including load balancer, on-off, monitoring on-off, services down, packages upgrade, services up, monitoring on, load balancer on, checking next server. Yes, we do that. We do it actually in an automated fashion. Team City, in our case, does trigger this kind of waves. And if there's any problem, the wave just stops and we go and check what happened. I think we've got time for just one more question. Hi, so uh, a lot of uh, teams, when they're deploying to a large set of servers, do the so-called canarying. So first you deploy to a server handling 1% of traffic or one tenth of percent of traffic, let it work with this small percent of traffic for a while, see if there are memory leaks, etc. then to 1%, 10%, and finally full fleet. Do you do such a thing? We do that in a few cases. In most cases, we don't do it so far. We are on the process of getting there. Um, 
our yet tooling can for example do exponential deployments it can like deploy one then it can deploy five and then it can deploy the remaining so to and if we but the thing is here yum repositories represent the target state in our world so this time of deployment it's kind of a fuzzy gray zone and in our world it's always okay to deploy the latest updates it's never wrong never nobody can be punished for doing yum upgrade so uh, how do you because if i understand correctly your commit to deploy cycle is around minutes maybe hour right so how do you deal with bugs that show up after like few hours of work or few millions of requests like i'm leaking four bytes of memory per request well, as a developer, it's your responsibility to think about the potential danger of your change. And if you have stuff that could go wrong in that way, then you need to deal with it already on the development side and not expect the deployment to solve your problems. And if you want to have a longer lasting state of different versions, then in our world, you create YUM repositories for that. You create, for example, our big core application creates a new YAM repository for each build. And in that YAM repository are a few hundred RPM packages with a few gigabyte of stuff. And in that case, we can always take a few servers, hook them up to the YAM repository of the next version, upgrade them all, and wait a little bit. And even if we would reinstall one of the Canary servers, it will automatically get the N plus one version it's supposed to be running. And we do a lot of state management, like you mentioned, in, with the help of YAM repositories by just creating special YAM repositories and putting packages there. Okay, um, I think that's time. So thank you very much.